Hello, I have perfected Mika and the Witch's Mountain on Steam by collecting all 31 achievements. This includes petting the dog, rescuing three ostrich chicks, assassin diving into hay, and a lot more we'll touch on a bit later. Welcome to my full review. Mika and the Witch's Mountain is a cozy fantasy adventure about a witch who delivers packages, being developed by Chibig and Nukefist while being published by Chibig. While it's currently being labeled as Early Access, the main content of the game is already here, with the plan of adding even more side content in the future. Full disclosure, I was graciously sent a review copy of the game, which you can find all the information for down below. However, with that in mind, it will not be altering my opinion on the title. Starting off with the settings, visually it's quite simple and I enjoy staring at this floating crow. However, they currently support 8 different languages with more planned for full release. The audio section holds your music and sound effect sliders, however there is currently no master volume or slider for cutscene audio, so just prepare during animated cutscenes to have your ears absolutely blown out. Controls offer an inverted jump, camera, and a faster camera speed if you so desire. I found the base settings to be just perfect. That said, there's no way to change your key bindings whatsoever. You're stuck with what you're given and you're going to like it. At the very bottom you'll see a delete save data button. This is here because there is currently no option to create a new save game once you've made one. This is a strange way to not allow save states, but I guess it works out. Just don't have plans on sharing the game with anyone until you've completed it yourself. You may have also noticed there's no video options here. Huh? That is because it's only found while in game through the graphics options. Uh, Once here you will find the windowed, depth of field, brightness, frame rate, and the whole shebang. I have no idea why you wouldn't include these in the main menu, but to be fair I guess most gamers playing a cozy game wouldn't care about them anyway. As for the technical side of things, please note I'm running this off a low to high end PC, so how this performs for me might not perform the same for you. With that being said, I experienced little to no hardware related issues whatsoever. The game is incredibly optimized and only requires a minimum of a GTX 1660 to run, with an RTX 2060 being recommended. I don't see many gamers struggling to run this unless you're on an ancient relic. The only hiccup I encountered was with audio. At one point it decided to just stop playing all incoming sounds, however walking through a wind stream fixed it all almost instantly was a weird little bug. As mentioned before, you are unable to rebind any of your keys. If you're playing this on a Switch controller, it obviously is the intended way and the game will feel absolutely incredible. However, I lost mine and was playing with a PlayStation controller instead, which the game will be launching on eventually. So I have to point out, it isn't natural for the jump button being on triangle as it's almost always on X. This made the controller gameplay feel a lot worse and take a lot longer to adapt to so keyboard and mouse was overall the better choice for me in the end. The only problem I had with it was a controller is still required to be able to zoom into these constellations. Not a huge deal as it can be labeled as an easter egg, but this is another example of why keybinds should exist in every title. As for the difficulty, there are no difficulty options. The difficulty of the game comes down to how well you can traverse the world, deliver packages without damaging them, and finding all secrets the game has to offer. On the difficulty scale, I'd say it's just slightly above easy. While it's an insanely cozy laid back game, it does provide a few challenges here and there. As for its replayability, you're given no reason to do so unless you're after a full completion or its achievements. The game is quite linear, however heavily values exploration and side content. I'd heavily recommend playing the game to completion versus just its main storyline anyway. As for the gameplay, in short, Mika and the Witch's Mountain is a cell shaded fantasy adventure about an inspiring witch who must deliver fragile packages to the townspeople of a small island, in a timely manner while using her magical broom to not only soar the skies, but discover all the secrets hidden deep within the mountain and achieve the ultimate goal of reaching the top. Starting from the very beginning, you're immediately thrown into the tutorial, which is nothing but a few slabs of text explaining basic movement and the very few important mechanics you'll need to know once you stumble into them. I love how quickly you're thrown in with just enough information to get an idea on what you should be doing, followed by nothing but your own curiosity. It's paced out perfectly and provides a lot of freedom to do whatever you wish regardless of the story you're focused on. As for the UI, it is incredibly clean across the board and I absolutely love the idea of having a notebook being the menu. The fact it's an appealing yellow tinge versus a generic white piece of paper is a great choice. The entire color scheme is honestly very cozy. As for the playable UI, you'll only see around 4 items at any given time. The items you're holding, which depend on how upgraded your broom is, your broom itself, and your companion crow helping you out with the main quest line and also saving your game. The only downside with the menu is you can tell it was heavily made with controller in mind 
behind. Mouse movement isn't allowed, and scrolling through the menus on keyboard is a bit wonky. As for the questing, they're separated in chapters through delivery cards. Each card you obtain will hold a set amount of items you'll have to deliver to the correct recipients. Your earnings are based on your performance, with each delivery having their own attributes. Most packages have hearts, which shows the max amount of times it can be damaged. A water droplet indicates it can't get wet. A caution sign shows it's fragile, taking damage easier and a clock is a timed rushed delivery. Some items won't have any indicators or even a set location on where they should go. These are mostly found in your personal delivery card, which can be counted as the side quests of the game. Successfully delivering packages will provide you a stamp and payment accordingly, which is required to upgrade your broom with. If the delivery is perfect, you'll get a green stamp and get paid. If you get a yellow stamp, you earn nothing but an unsatisfied customer. And if you get a red stamp, well, your employer will have a heart attack. The delivery system is quite wonderful and overall a really fun time. I do however wish there were a lot more time getting deliveries as you just barely see them. That challenge alone provides a lot of panic I weirdly enjoyed. The side quests can be confusing as they provide no information on who to deliver to, which is the challenge I did enjoy. It felt like there was more side content than there is a main quest line, however they are all technically connected together so it flowed quite nicely. Now if you happen to damage an item too much, you have two options. The first being to deliver it anyway and hope you get a green stamp for being a cutie, or the second to be resetting that item. You can sometimes do so by dropping it on the ground until it despawns, or you can hold the drop button and it will trash the first item in your hand, respawning it back to the exact location you got it. There is literally no penalty for doing so aside from wasting your time flying back. While this is a helpful mechanic, and I'm not going to complain too much, I do wish there was more of a penalty. Perhaps resetting it too many times breaks the item and you're forced to deliver it for a red stamp. That'd be pretty funny. The side content that confused me the most is this mailbox. You're told fairly quickly how to use him, you just input a code and will get a package or a secret message. All of the codes seem to be magic numbers as they're not told, shown, or found literally anywhere in the game, aside from your first outfit. While trying a bunch of random combinations, I found a few that will provide a random package. One-hearted, fragile, with no location or hint. I tried delivering it to every single character in the world to no avail. It could be very well not implemented yet, or I'm just missing valuable information. But if anyone figures this out, please by all means, let me know. As for easter eggs, this game is absolutely full of random references. I think the Zelda ones are too obvious, so a few others I found include the infamous Froggy Chair, the Lord of the Rings, and our two favorite boys, Mario and the Wagi. I'm sure there are many more I didn't pick up on, or at least know the actual reference of, but I absolutely love when games are full of little easter eggs, let alone tying them into their own unique world. If the devs happen to be listening, I would be forever grateful to have you include this rubber host smile somewhere in the next update. It could be our own little easter egg showing me you watched the video. I even drew it myself. Moving into the wonderful cell shaded world of Mika, visually it's gorgeous, wholesome, and very cozy. It heavily gives off Wind Waker vibes, especially with the water, and I love that. As for the world itself, you're stuck with one fairly large island with a massive mountain in the middle. Your ultimate goal is to reach the top, but you will stick around its lower layers for quite a while, learning about its inhabitants, collecting collectibles, and upgrading your broom to eventually explore higher. The people of the world all have something to say, while some even having packages to be delivered. It is worth noting where everyone is located while exploring as it will benefit you greatly while going back to them. If you have a poor memory, you do have a world map which will provide all the locations once found. I'll touch more on that a bit later. While progressing the delivery cards, character locations will also sometimes change. While this can be a bit confusing, it does add a nice bit of variety to keep you on your toes. Touching on the movement, obviously you start with nothing but your two feeties, so you'll be walking everywhere until you find someone who can repair your magic broom. Once found, you'll be able to use your repaired broom to start flying around wherever you'd like. Upgrading your broom will change the visuals alongside provide access to airways which will allow you to zoom around the world much faster. You'll also unlock an ability to boost your height eventually. Overall I much enjoyed the movement, however it will take you a bit to get used to. It's not like your generic flight mechanic as you're always floating downwards. On flat terrain it always feels like you're bouncing across it which does does provide broom-like immersion, but can make it a bit difficult to time your jumps with. This is where the wind streams will also come into play, as you'll want to be trying to use them as much as possible. On top of unlocking all of the catapults placed around the water, they'll help you zoom across the world and get to places otherwise unreachable. That being said, the upward gusts of wind can be extremely frustrating as some are also very precise. It's hard keeping your girl in one place, let alone trying to keep her in a small wind tunnel. If you're not dancing it back and forth or going into it as slowly as possible, you can sometimes be thrown out the other side or just miss them altogether. I found it a bit weird having to slow down in a game mostly about going fast, but it wasn't all that immersion breaking. 
As for the collectibles, there are a total of 125 to find out in the open world. A hundred of them are small Napopo figures, mostly hidden in plain sight, with some being tucked away and much harder to see spots. They are used for purchasing two outfits and three charms for your broom. Fifteen tarot cards are found within large urns placed around the world, where you must gain a lot of height and break them with your body in order to obtain the amazing art within. And the remaining five broom trails are unlocked by finding hidden ancient statues around the world and reading the cryptic message. Now before I complain even a little bit, I want to say these collectibles were incredibly well done. They all seemed well thought out and perfectly placed, whether it was in view of discoveries or tucked away in more challenging spots. I had an amazing time trying to find them all and never once did it feel like it was a chore. As for my complaints, I wish there was a little more to unlock with the figured currency as the cutest outfit is obviously the kitten. The charms are cute and all, but having them tied to the broom is a little bit of a letdown. You will rarely ever see them unless you're looking out for them. I originally thought they would be attached to your backpack, growing more with each one unlocked, but that was just my idea. Speaking of ideas, the tarot cards are very unique and look absolutely incredible. They just sadly serve no purpose outside of being eye candy and an extra thing to collect. A slight broom increase per one found would go hard. Anyway, I almost forgot to mention, if you're ever having trouble finding the figures, your trusty map is always by your side. It can be used to not only show locations of important characters, but also list the amount of figures you currently have or need in any given location you have currently unlocked. Use your resources and you won't struggle all too much. The way you unlock portions of the map is by going to to these bulletin boards and simply reading them. This will show the location and every figure left to find. As for the audio, I was quite impressed at how well it kept me immersed throughout the insanely cozy world. The attention to detail is really nice and nothing really sounds out of place. The music typically changing depending on location with every track being more upbeat than the last. I would say it's an easy original soundtrack to add to any list you currently have. That all being said, my only critique with the audio comes with the voice acting, or well, the lack of. Instead of being fully voice acted, the characters are given their own emotional noises, such as giggles, hmms, ahs, and a few others. <laughs> While this is probably a stylistic choice I can get behind, regardless of not always liking to read, the problem for me lies with some of the characters reusing the same emotional sound bits. You're penalized for reading too fast and hearing double emotions emotions from separate characters can be very off-putting. Hey, you made it to the story section and my thoughts on it. I won't be covering the spoilers in depth, but if you would like to avoid them, skip ahead to the positive and negative section below. Ready? Okay. You play as Mika, an inspiring witch who must learn her lessons by getting kicked off a mountain. Her broom snapped and delivering packages to the townsfolk of a small island. They will all rate your service with stamps as she earns money to acquire new brooms and flying capabilities. All with the main goal of reaching the top of the mountain where she originally started. Throughout the game you will come across a large variety of characters scattered throughout the island, some of which will continue developing their stories after what happened in previous games by the studio. Mika is directly connected with taking place sometime after the Summer in Mara title. However, that being said, you are not required to play the other titles to understand what is happening. They do a great job assuming you've never played the others and still portray each character's story accordingly, making them all easy to grab onto. I thought it was pretty cool to have a main story being told through many other side stories, all while completing the main objective. The animated cutscenes, aside from being incredibly loud, were absolutely fantastic. I wish there was a lot more of them. Now if you're rushing through, I will say the main story is incredibly fast and leaves you wanting a lot more. I highly recommend taking your time, exploring the world, and just doing every piece of content it throws at you. A full experience will provide more than a fast one. As much before, there are a total of 31 achievements, all of which took me 5.5 hours to obtain, while well, a single playthrough took 3. I will not be mentioning the ones handed to you just by playing, however let's start with the more missable achievements, such as Mikasel, where you must break this kid's sandcastle and watch him cry. I originally did it by accident, but as the story progresses, you can keep coming back while he builds it up bigger than the last. Mika the Teenage Witch is obtained by handing out every item you were given at the start of the game. The moment you choose not to be nice, you lose out on this achievement. There's also a missed opportunity here for having an achievement tied to keeping them all to yourself. Last but not least, 5 out of 5 stars is obtained by getting the highest stamp rating in all deliveries possible. This achievement might feel impossible knowing before going in, but just trust the game. The hardest achievement award will be going to no one left which is obtained by collecting all 100 Napopo figures. The difficulty comes with feeling blind trying to find them all in their hidden locations. Now let's go over some of the positives. It's a game for all ages with great design, gameplay, and pacing. The visuals are cute with lots of easter eggs. It's heavily focused around being a relaxing time. Has wonderful exploration, movement mechanics, and items to collect, and will eventually have even more side content being released. As for the negatives, there are no save states. It has a few audio related issues. 
no option to change keybinds at all, and the game is fairly short, making you crave a lot more once it's over. In conclusion, Mika and the Witch's Mountain is a short, cozy game with a beautiful aesthetic, wholesome soundtrack, and a great game to kick your feet up for. Would I recommend it? Well... Mika is currently available for 26 Canadian doll hairs or your regional equivalent on Steam and the Nintendo Switch storefront, with PlayStation and Xbox being released sometime later this year. After fully perfecting the game, I can say it's absolutely worth supporting them over. If you're looking for a short, cozy game to add to your collection, you won't regret picking this one up. Once again, a huge thank you to Chibig for providing me a key for this review. Mika and the Witch's Mountain. 5 out of 6. Thank you so much for watching. If you made it this far, let me know your thoughts down below or what game I should complete next. Subscribe so you never miss a video, and until next time, take care.